circuitous route to where she is now. But she did a, a study here. She worked with the psychology lab and also with the physical oceanography lab when she was a grad student here. And she has the seminal paper, the one paper on rotolith ocean, uh, physical oceanography that what characterizes the movement of rotolith turning over. And so she might tell you a little bit more about her thesis. But it really is the only work that has been done, and we're looking for another student that wants to run the field in Egypt and some fun. Uh, she then went to Hawaii after being at Moss Landing, and she worked for the National Park Service on coral reefs. And she might tell us more about that. But then she went back to UC Berkeley to get her PhD. And now she is a professor at San Catalina School, where she continues to do research. And she's also educating the youth of today. And she w came to WSN last November with a group of her students. So she really is taking her scientific uh, methodological approach to doing research and also introducing it to uh, high school students. So uh, maybe I'll let you actually find this. <laughs> okay. But we want to thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa, and she's local, so we're really interested in yeah. Well, it's really fun to be here. Um, I was the generation that was in the trailers, right? So Stephanie with Stephanie, and so anyway, it's beautiful here. Um, so one thing, if you become an expert in sort of an obscure system, you sound just so smart because you're the only one who knows anything about it. But in any case. Um, my work is on ankyline systems, ecosystems, and ankyline comes from the Greek ankyos, which means brackish. And so these are brackish groundwater systems that are in Hawaii, and they're very interesting. Um, I think before I get into the science of it, though, I just I was thinking about you guys have been in classes all day. You know, what what do you want to hear? You're here for pizza, but what can I interest you in? And so one is hopefully you'll be interested in, in the system. Um, I always like to go to talks, too, because I might see tools or approaches that might be useful for me. Um, so maybe I can present some things. Maybe you've seen it all. I don't know. And then other, the other thing is um, just my path, because I wish someone had talked to me when I was a, ma a master's student a little bit more about kind of places to go. And I, I'm sure it was out there, but I wasn't clued into it. So I'm definitely happy to talk to people more about that. Um, OK. So. The, this is a, uh, an incline pool, and what I'm going to do is, is just tell you a little bit about incline pools in general and then the sea level rise project that I did. Um, there's quite a bit of ecology in it as well. So my background is in geology from Williams, and then I got into this ecological question um, with Moss Landing, with rotoliths. Um, a lot of my work is pretty interdisciplinary, which is really fun. So ankyline pools occur in this porous bedrock. And in Hawaii, this is the basalt lava, which is like a sponge. There's lots of cracks and crevices. And the groundwater itself is coming from upslope. Um, but there's this marine lens that's moving in here, too, and it's mixing. And so these ankyline pools go up and down with the tides. Um, they're, they're very brackish. They can be two parts per thousand salinity, up to 30 parts per thousand. And they are found worldwide. So we actually, out here in the Pacific, um, here in Hawaii, we're the only part of the, the U United States that has ankyline pools, but Puerto Rico has some as well. Um, and you can see here a lot of places that have karst. So this limestone, old limestone, also has ankyline systems. So the cenote caves, for example, in the Yucatan are also considered ankyline systems. So uh, someone at Berkeley actually was doing work in those and cave diving. Mine were not as deep or scary to dive in. But. Uh, and so in Hawaii, actually, they're found throughout the islands, but they tend to be very densely found here on the main Hawaii, the, the big island, which is actually where I'm from. Originally, I was born and raised here. Um, this is the youngest island, and so the, the ground is particularly porous here, and you find these pools. Um, part of this story is the groundwater in Hawaii, and so it, it basically rains upslope and then percolates down and runs offshore. And what you're seeing here is a thermal infrared image of the shoreline, um, basically off of Kona. If you fly into Kona, you fly in up here.
So, but the other thing that's significant here, well, let me just say what, what you're seeing here is the red is warm, salty ocean water, and look at all these groundwater plumes coming offshore. Um, when I started working at the Park Service, I worked there for nine years, a lot of what we were doing was doing coral reef surveys, inventory monitoring kind of work. And really a big piece of the story is this groundwater, because the groundwater is actually delivering nutrients, but this entire industrial complex, including Costco, is on septic system. Everything is going straight into the groundwater and straight offshore. And so part of the reason we were interested in looking at the corals was we were worried about future development. There's over 5,000 homes planned for right here, big developments for here. So right now, things are good. Solution to pollution is dilution. That's happening. But um, we're worried about what's happening in the future. And so we became very interested in these ankline pools, which you can't see here, but they're located all along the coastline. And they're windows into the groundwater. And in a way, they're, I, I would say, the canary in the coal mine. What's going on in these pools might give you some indication of what may be changing and going offshore later to the corals. Um, OK, enough, enough there. So ankline pools have these very cool species associated with them. Um, these, the ones in Hawaii, most of them are endemic. Uh, this is actually a candidate endangered endemic. To these shrimp, in Hawaiian you call these opai, opai ula, which are red shrimp. Um, these two species are on, only found in Hawaii. This is the dominant grazer in the system, these little tiny red shrimp. They can be thousands of them covering the bottom. They're grazing on the biofilm. Um, this is a candidate endangered a larger shrimp that actually preys on these little guys. And then these two are, are much rarer. You only find them in a few places on the island and ankline pools. Um, interestingly, this one is found across the Indo-Pacific. It's also found in Japan. So um, one last thing, this snail is undescribed. It's a very tiny little snail we found. There's a Japanese researcher who is actually doing a species description of it. So it hasn't been named, so if anyone wants, you know, that's up for grabs. But the interesting thing about these shrimp and the ankyline snails is that their larvae actually move down in the groundwater. So that when you're standing on the ground, you have to think about this whole ecosystem underground. And the only place you're seeing it is wells or these pools. Their larvae move between islands. So they're being passed um, with these currents passively. So pretty fascinating system. So threats to these pools include coastal development, um, groundwater quantity and quality. So you know you build these developments, you need to draw out this groundwater to for the vegetation, but also what's going in. You know you've got golf courses putting all kinds of things on. It's going straight down into the groundwater. Um, also introduced fishes, which I'll talk a little bit about later, really throw off the system, and then sea level rise. So. When I was working at the park, this is Koloko Honokohau National Historic Park. Here's the highway. It's about a 540-acre piece of land that's on land, piece of land that's on land, terrestrial park. But then there's this whole offshore area that has really great coral reef. Um, it's very rich in uh, cultural sites. So that's why it's a National Historic Park. But in any case, um, in 2006, this development went right in. They got to build right up to the park boundary. Um, any ankyline, there's ankyline pools. This is a fish pond, wetland area. Um, any ankyline pools, they only had to leave a five foot buffer around ankyline pools. You know, and so that kind of, that just drove us nuts at the park. So this slide here is really the impetus for me to kind of do this whole project. So, Sea level rise. I think a lot of you have probably seen a slide like this before. We are expecting um, by the year 2100 anywhere between 1 to 1.9 meters. Of course, it doesn't stop there. We're expecting greater sea level rise past there. Um, this is our observed sea level rise. This is a, a global average. If you look at the Pacific, uh, this is from Topex Poseidon satellites that are looking at the levels of the ocean. And you can see, here's Hawaii right out here in the middle. Um, the red is areas where we've had an increase over mean sea level. So th the red is the hotter areas where there's been more sea level rise. And what's interesting is you can see 
in the Western Pacific that there's been a lot greater sea level rise overall. Um, Hawaii is kind of right here in the middle. So the global average that has been measured at different tide gauges is 3.4 millimeters a year. Um, in Hawaii, it's a little bit less. down under them. So you have the subsidence, you have sea level, mean sea level rise, and put that together, we're at about um, the global average. So my questions. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about just was the best, the best methods I found for modeling sea level rise effects because it, it developed over time. And so what my plan was, was I really just wanted initially to make some sea level rise models that we could use for planning, but I really learned some things along the way, and often you, the question you start with shifts, and that's sort of what happened, and, and I think in a cool way. Um, how are these systems gonna respond to sea level rise at a landscape scale, and then to what extent will sea level rise aid in the dispersal of introduced fish? So I'll just focus on those three things. Um, there's been a lot of other directions and different projects, some genetic stuff, some stable isotope stuff, but I'll focus on these today. And you can see these very beautiful ankline pools here. Um, so, if anyone has any questions, raise your hand. Feel free, stop me. Okay, so as with a lot of sea level rise models, we have to start with a really good topographic surface, um, an elevation surface. And so, you know, under the ocean, this would be a bathymetry model. On, on terrestrial surfaces, uh, we've got this digital elevation model that's built off of LIDAR. So, you know, for those of you who work in bathymetry in Carrie's lab, you're sh shooting this from a boat and getting bathymetry, it's from the plane. Um, basically, what you're looking at here, I've color coded it. This is a fish pond. This is a, a lava flow. These are waves coming in. Oops. So you can see the waves that are coming into shore here and the sand berm. But we are lucky because the FEMA LIDAR that they flew in 2008 had an average one meter um, average distance from each other. So I was able to make really fine scale elevation models. So on top of these elevation models, um, I placed these scenarios of a half meter, one meter, and one and a half meter mean sea level rise. And then also looked at the local tidal datum. So what was the mean high water in Hawaii? And what is an annual extreme tides? These aren't as high as here in California. But of course, if you're interested in flooding, you're going to want to know when the water's the highest. Um, and one of the reasons that I use this one meter digital elevation grid is that some of these pools are very tiny. They can be just a meter by meter. Um, some are, are larger. But I really wanted a fine scale elevation model so I could detect where the new pools might be popping up. So when I created these models, I think you guys have probably seen something like this. Um, each of these different colors represents water surface at a different sea level scenario. So this is also part of the national park. Each yellow dot represents an ankling pool that I had mapped and surveyed and knew a lot about the biology and size and so forth. And so this is the zero, this is current times at an extreme tide. You can see flooding. Um, here is the half meter at mean high water. Gonna, sorry. And then um, this is at progressive sea level scenarios. And what you see is, of course, these pools get inundated. They become part of the marine environment eventually. But um, one thing that's very cool is you have new pools popping up in the landscape. And so as part of the environmental science department at Berkeley, we want to protect these areas, right? We want to protect them for the future. But one of the things that I found when I did these models, first of all, there's no waves included in this. Um, there's no erosion, which isn't such a big deal on this coast because it's not sandy beach so much, it's more basalt. Um, but there's no groundwater involved. And what happened was I realized that there are some big pools here, like here, that I should expect to see water at our current conditions, but I'm not seeing it on the map. So that made me think, hmm, there's something missing here. And I started thinking about groundwater. Well, it turns out that in these Pacific Islands, not just Hawaii, but in a lot of these Pacific Islands, that groundwater is actually perched above sea level. 
So if this is mean sea level, it's never that flat, but if that's it, um, you have groundwater actually increasing in height, resting above it, and going up and down with the tides every day. So if you imagine this well that's right here as a pool, um, that potentially would be the height of the water surface that's flooding at a higher tide. And so one thing that was very cool is some colleagues of mine, here's Honokoha Harbor, here's the park. They had been collecting sea level data in these wells and in three pools over a year's time, and from 2009 to 2010. And so when I took the mean groundwater height in each of those wells, so here's distance from shore, here's right near shoreline, and here's as we go inland. And you can see the furthest in is right near Costco, three and a half kilometers in. If you've been to Hawaii, like if you want to run into everyone, you know you go to Costco. So it's, it's a non-trivial place, I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, here, here all these little places are plotted, right? And we see this nice curve. And that's the groundwater surface above mean sea level. So pretty cool. I look, this guy Glover in 1959 predicted Groundwater levels in an unconfined aquifer are expected to be a function of the square root of distance from the shoreline. That's exactly what that is. Pretty cool. So um, now what I could do was I put this into, oh, this, this is just going to show you. Here's an ankline pool real close to shore. Look at these tides that are happening in it. This is about 200 meters in from the shore. So the groundwater is just part of and this groundwater in that pool is about 15 parts per thousand. Um, this is the well that's in three and a half kilometers, and it's also experiencing that semi diurnal tide, which I think is pretty amazing. So um, that's what I wanted to include into my models. The other thing, um, I can talk more about this with people who might be interested, but as you go inland, this is just showing you the plot that as you go inland, that that tidal efficiency or the range of the tide decreases as you go in. That's just what you saw previously. But further inland, you have much less of a range of tide. So I put all those things together into a groundwater slope. The initial, um, that initial curve that you saw, the tidal efficiency, and our sea level rise scenarios, put them into a, a grid. And then I was able to add that into the sea level rise scenarios. And then I tested that against you know, 300 pools that I had surveyed. And actually, models with groundwater, so these sea level scenario models with groundwater, were 37% better at detecting known pools than without. So I felt like, okay, this was giving me, I was getting a better model than I might if I just did this bathtub model that people talk about. Okay, everyone with me? So that's, I can talk more about that, but that's sort of how I developed my models was this, approach. So this is a neighborhood that's right on the shore. It's called Puoko. Um, it's, you know, multi-million dollar homes. It's on the Kona coast. And, you know, you can see the current shoreline in red. And this is the, potentially the year 2050. We have a half meter scenario with mean high water. The lighter color is with groundwater, so it causes more flooding. I actually showed this to the community association. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, it was, it was hard, right? Because these are their homes. But I think they wanted to know. They're, they're a pretty progressive group. And so anyway, this is potentially by mid-century to the end of the century. And then this is the, the bigger expected by end of century. So these people have to decide, do they want to sell? Can, you know, should they sell? Or do they just love it for the place? There's a lot of decisions here. The other thing, um, coral reef-wise, a lot of Work is being done by the Nature Conservancy right offshore here. There's really great coral. Um, there's a lot, of, almost all these homes are in cesspool, and they've already noticed that there's quite a bit of nutrients right inshore. The corals aren't happy. As you go further out, they're better. So the community is actually voluntarily thinking about trying to remove cesspools because of that. And we're going to be piecing together this ground, this sea level rise with that to help them make some decisions about where it would be best to do that, because the groundwater as it moves up is hitting the cesspools. You don't want that in your backyard. Okay, I just put this in here because any model is a model. It's our best guess. 
we're thinking that the Kona coast is probably going to get drier with climate change, and so the groundwater may lessen. But this is at least kind of the worst and best at this, at this stage, with most groundwater and least. So I think a big thing that I wanted to do, and the people that funded me, I got funded for this by the Alika Hakai National Historic Trail, and they wrap all the way around the west side of the island and up around the south end. Um, and so this was shared with the Park Service, the county planners, who were actually very interested in this. They didn't feel like they had political leverage to do anything with the maps, but they really are interested. And what we want to avoid is this situation, because the incline pool here is protected, but where is it going to move? So for future development, a lot of this coast is not developed. You know, can we, can we think about letting these habitats move? Okay. So next we're going to go to talking about um, how these ecosystems might respond to sea level rise at a landscape scale. And the easiest way to do this, I thought, was um, I compared two resort parcels, two state conservation parcels, and two national parks. And they're all along the west side here. And I wanted to see how many pools are there, how many get inundated, how many get created. Um, one thing I took into account was the different land surfaces there now. So this is um, one of the conservation parcels. Each dot is an incline pool that exists now. This is a big lava flow. This is some veg. Um, this is one of the, the resort areas. And you can see that there's quite a bit of this lawn. And then the impervious surface is kind of grayed out. So when I was doing this exercise, basically if there was impervious surface, like a parking lot or a building, I was assuming that couldn't turn into new habitat unless we dig it out, right? It's kind of basic stuff. So um, at the National Park, you know, there's no development here. And you can see as we step through sea level right here, we step through the scenarios um, going from about 2050 to here's potentially the end of century. We get a lot of inundation of pools, but we get creation of these new pools, quite a few in the lava landscape, right? Um, at the resort, a little bit different story, where are the habitats going to move? This is a, a protected complex of pools right now. It's probably going to turn into an estuary very soon. Um, these areas that are popping up as pools are in the parking lots or on the golf course, but that's at least easier to dig out for new habitat. It's just going to turn into habitat. Someone's going to give it up. Um, but in general, and this isn't rocket science, of course, but I was trying to make the point that let's plan for future habitat, that in the resort areas, each of these, so this is the number of pools here, that, and the white is what exists now. The dark color are what exists in the future. And each of these is a different scenario, time step. And you can see. At the resort, there's not a lot of pools, and there's not a lot of room for new pools. They haven't planned for it. No surprise. Conservation lands and one of the park lands, you know, we're going to be flooding these current pools, but we have a lot of new pools that are going to emerge. And one thing that I think this is important, actually, in planning is there's always scientists on both sides, right, of, this, of these developments. There's people there that say, why should we make an effort to improve water quality when sea level rise is just going to cover these pools anyway? What's the big deal? Well, the response would be, yeah, but we've got a lot of new pools that are going to form. And these are all groundwater, too. So I think this has been helpful um, to show that. OK, the other part of this story are these new pools that emerge. Um, the really cool thing about these endemic species is they move underground, and they populate these new habitats very quickly. One reason we know that is Koho'olawe, which is an island that was used a lot for bombing by the military, bombing practice. They, the bombing created a whole new lake, and very quickly, there's no incline pools on that island. And very quickly, these, these species showed up, because they're moving through the groundwater from other islands even. Um, the other thing that we know is if you dig a hole, the shrimp will show up. So we know that they'll move very quickly into new habitats. They also have a really wide range of salinity. You find them, this is the one, the little species, and this is the bigger Canada endangered one, but they're found in a really wide range of species. 
And some recent physiology work shows they actually can survive up to 50 parts per thousand. So they have a really interesting physiology to be able to do that. Okay, the other part of this story is interest in these introduced fishes, because they're a big threat to the species in these pools. So I love the field, you know, the GIS stuff I love too, but you're behind a computer, and so I had to balance that in the field. So I did um, make it part of my work plan to survey as much as I could. So I was able to go many parts of this shoreline and survey over 400 pools. Um, and again, some are very tiny, some are bigger. Some have this really interesting microbial mat that's associated with them. Um, and so I did everything from physical parameters to water. First of all, 40% of the pools have tilapia, not a native. 24% um, have guppies or mosquito fish. These were brought in for mosquito control back in the 20s. Tilapia were brought in in the 50s. The state of Hawaii has a really interesting background of bringing in things in the 50s that they thought would be good food. Like there's this Tahitian grouper, a roy, that they brought in because they thought people would like it, but it actually has ciguatera levels that are really high, so no one wants to eat it, and now it's everywhere. So anyway, um, so these guys do eat the shrimp, and an interesting story is when these fish appear, the shrimp start hiding, and they actually shift to a nighttime species. They'll only come out at night and graze, and that happens within a day. But if you remove the fish, the opposite happens. The shrimp show up within 24 hours. So with these 400 pools, um, a general additive model, looking at every single parameter I collected, what were the most important things for determining the presence or the absence of these endemic species? The fish were the most important parameter, and they had a highly significant negative effect. So we know that they have a big effect on these endemic species. And with sea level rise, if this is a fish pond that has tilapia and guppies in it, at these extreme tides, it's pretty obvious they're going to be able to move into habitats that they haven't been in before. And then when the tides go back down, there they are. So one of the things that I did in some core areas was I looked at pools. This is a cluster of pools. One, this one has had guppies for the last 10 years and they have never moved into these other pools. So they're not able to move underground, although the shrimp do. And so I did this exercise where um, in these areas, when you flooded at these higher sea levels, did the shrimp or did the um, fish disperse into new habitats? And which, using this kind of exercise, which pools were maybe the ones we needed to focus on for introduced fish removal? Like which ones were gonna be the seed bank for trashing pools near them, uh, which are the hot spots. Uh, the other thing, this is a similar plot to before, where here's a number of pools. Each of these is a different location with the different scenarios. And the fish pools are in dark. The light pools have no fish. What was interesting is as you start flooding the pools with fish, um, potentially the fish go away because it becomes a marine environment and you might have some pristine pools. But that's something we have to watch because people will move them. They'll, um, and we've actually seen the native um, night heron, the auku'u, flying with tilapia and dropping them in a pool that didn't have them before. So, yeah. Anyway, for those of you involved in any restoration work, it's kind of an interesting effort. Um, the last thing that I tried to do just with this data set was look at maybe associations of which pools out of all the ones I looked at, those 400, the tilapia tended to be associated with, with fresher water. Um, and they also tended to be associated with bigger pools. That might be of some interest to people trying to identify which pools are the best to remove from. Interestingly, though, um, someone just told me last week that tilapia are showing up in the shoreline at Kaneohe Bay. They're not supposed to be able to survive in salt water, but apparently these are, so I don't know. It's all a mystery. 
Um, and then the last thing I'd say when you're doing this climate change stuff is to really think about um, how important marginal areas are. And you probably thought about this in the marine environment. For my pools, uh, my point that I wanted to make to people was these pools actually go dry at low tide and then the water comes in at high tide. And with the high water comes the shrimp. Three and a half meters away is another pool that always has water in it and it always has guppies in it. And you might think if you were planning that this was the most important because it had a lot of water in it, but actually these right here might be considered marginal sites. You know, we don't have to worry about those. That develop those, those are the non-important ones. In the future, they're gonna be the habitat that is gonna be really important. They're a refuge for the native species. So what did I do with all of this? Um, I, first of all, think groundwater is very important to be included in these tropical islands. Um, it isn't always. Sea level rise has the potential to create new habitat inland. I think with you know, Elkhorn Slough, you, the slough out here, you guys are very aware of that, but not something that everyone thinks about. Um, introduced species definitely have a potential to disperse with sea level rise, and these GIS models are available for all the local planners. What has been very cool is um, I wrote a proposal with someone from the Nature Conservancy on the Big Island, and we just got funded for three years from NOAA to do some development of this. So we're actually gonna be refining the sea level rise models, including wave overtopping. Um, I was just there last week and we put in a bunch of new sensors in the groundwater th up and down the coast so we can add data there. Um, we're also developing an online tool for the state, county, and local people who are interested in planning. Um, one thing that I didn't mention but I'm really excited about is using stable isotopes in the shrimp tissues to indicate sewage in the groundwater. And that's been really coming out very obvious, actually. So that's kind of brand new, interesting stuff. But, uh, and this right here is this amazing water cave that if you ever come visit, you can go swim in here. And it, this is groundwater that's two parts per thousand. It's only about, I'd say 50 yards from the ocean. And it's two parts per thousand. It's really amazing. You can swim way back where it's pitch black. It's a lava tube. Um, all kinds of cool critters in there. Okay, the last thing that I think is kind of the up and coming, if you're interested in sea level rise, kind of the latest stuff right now that, that a lot is out there is this idea that this bathtub model that a lot of people have been doing the last, they call it the bathtub because here's your ground surface and you just raise or lower it, right? Well, the ocean's way more complex than that. We all know that. Um, so basically what this is showing is all the different components of sea level. And so in the Pacific, um, you've got these storms, right, that are definitely contributing to big events. Um, and then you have tidal fluctuations, which I incorporated, but you also have ENSO. And ENSO actually, if you look at El Nino over in the West Pacific, just because um, there's no ENSO right now, the ocean is a foot lower and corals are being exposed. When it is, um, when we're back in more normal conditions, the ocean's a foot higher. So that has, that is not necessarily something that's a one-way direction. We also have these ocean circulations, PDO, um, sea level rise is what we've been talking about, but these vertical land motions are different everywhere. So when we're trying to refine models, I think it's really important to take all these pieces into account. And so I'm working with someone from NOAA to incorporate this in our Hawaii models, and we like to call it the storms, which would be more the wave overtopping, um, and the norms, which just the norm, depending on if it's El Nino or not, or PDO or not, can really vary. And those are gonna be swinging back and forth through time. So the point being that sea level rise isn't just this. And so planners want to know if it, well, something to think about. If, some, if a roadway floods once a year, no big deal, you drive through it. But if it's going to start flooding once a week, at what point do you give it up? So we're trying to include this sort of frequency stuff into our modeling. And that's been a really interesting um, part of the project that I'm involved in now. So as with every 
project, there's just a ton of people involved. And the, the initial funding for this was through the Park Service and Berkeley. Um, I'll just say, in terms of my path, I never thought I would go back and get a PhD. I probably should have done it earlier and maybe be a professor somewhere like you guys. But um, the project really drove me into this because I really want, felt like this was important for the community. They needed it for planning. And I got the funding and then I ended up at Berkeley and you know, it was really exciting. It's fun to be in school. So enjoy it. Yeah. Okay, so that's really what I, I had to show, but I'm hopefully that was some new information, not stuff you just the other thing that was interesting at Berkeley, I'll just say, is I was surrounded by terrestrial people. And so it was really interesting that I hung out with a lot of stream ecologists and wetland ecologists, and there's a lot of they do cool stuff too. And there's stuff they're talking about that I had never heard of. So I think that was really valuable. So anyway, if you have questions or Um, 
The same problem is going in, in Hilo and the coast. So they're getting sea level rise and nuisance flowing really badly. And people there have these cesspools that are flooding and it's flooding into their backyard. And the county planner last week said they see the problem, but it, when it comes to spending the money to fix it, you know, they, that's when it starts getting I don't know how it happened here, but in the early 70s, they, they got rid of all the sewage outfalls. They condensed one in the, in the marina, and they got rid of septic tanks in a lot of places. Well, I think California is ahead of a lot of decisions. <laughs> <laughs> There's basically been three people on the island who have been telling everybody what it is for the last 30 years. And they have PhDs, and now you have these new people. Not that I'm young, but there's some other people in there, and they're like, it's, yeah, it's different stories. Yes? So the experiment on the pool systems just seems like it's a sort of a perfect system to do you know, manipulative experiments, you know, moving fish around or shrimp or whatever, trying to look at the interactions that are happening in the community. Are you guys doing any of that? Yeah, um, well, so first of all, one thing, because it's pretty hard for permitting to move things around, because you can't put introduced species into places that don't have them. And they're also, they are units, but they're they're all connected too, so it's hard to trap the shrimp. I initially had thought about lining some, mm -hmm. um, but there has been a lot of work actually using stable isotopes for food web analysis in different kinds of pools. Um, there have been little exclusion cage situations within the pool. Um, so that's been really interesting. And a lot of it's been the interaction between the fish and the shrimp uh, and then potentially the algae. The algae itself, often you don't see anything if it's a healthy pool. They're just eating the little, they're grazing off the little um, slime, so to speak. The other thing that's been really interesting is on the little, the little red shrimp, some population genetics has shown that there are these really distinct lineages within parts of islands. It's almost like they're aquifers. So they're moving in the groundwater there, and then they may get occasionally to another island or another place. Um, so that's been interesting. And they even caught, figured out that people were taking shrimp from a natural reserve and selling them to the mainland. Because you can buy these little shrimp in, in Nebraska. <laughs> and so they were, you know, the county, let's say, had no idea where they were coming from. So it's, it's considered them some interesting work. Yeah, I agree. It would be fun to do more. Yes? Um, so, a little bit similar. Since you have all this, um, this environmental data from all these pools, um, in other places it's been shown that more pristine habitats are more resistant to invasion. Um, does it look like that's happening in these pools where if it's, um, there's not a lot of nutrient, but if it's more pristine pool, it's less likely to be invaded? Or are the ecosystems just so naturally impoperate, no matter what, that they'll be invaded? That's an interesting question. Um, well, if we're going just by the presence or absence of the native shrimp, they just disappear when the fish show up. Although the guppies, they only have so big gape mouths, so they, they actually have um, the larger shrimp still hang around. Uh, but one thing that maybe falls in with your question, is that the tilapia are prolific poopers. And so in those pools, I've noticed they have really, instead of rock, you end up with this really thick bio accumulation. Um, another thing I didn't talk about was introduced plants. So you may have seen baddest um, pickleweed around. That's not native there. And where you have these introduced plants, they tend to, I think, start filling things in and adding to the infill. Um, but beyond that, I don't know, but it would be really interesting to look at, for sure. Yes? You talk about groundwater input and then tidal um, change. And that's about sea level rise, um, how the area is going to change. But you did talk about rainfall mm -hmm. and patterns of shifting rainfall. And mm -hmm. when you showed those two pools, one that empties at low tide mm -hmm. and one that doesn't, how does rainfall play into it and also into your projections? Yeah, that's great. Um, so this part of the island is super dry. So this is, you know, the Hawaiian Islands, let's think of it like an op a limpet or an opihi shell in Hawaii, and the trades come in from the west, they hit, everything drops on the, the um, sorry, the east side, so Hilo side, and then it's dry when it gets to Kona. 
Um, so rain in terms of right at the coast doesn't have a big effect on these. However, there's a lot of rain upslope, and that's what's feeding the groundwater. Um, and right now, someone from the USGS is trying to figure out that lag, because there's a lot of people that want that groundwater right now and to take it out for development, and so they're worried about, is there going to be enough? And also, the prediction is for drying climates. So there's a lot of unknowns, and so I, there's some people, including myself, that say, well, we should be cautious. Got 5,000 home development, let's think about the water. Um, so, yes? It sounds like you have a really close relationship with different local and um, state organizations. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering how you specifically communicate your research and kind of in the early stages of this project, was this an idea that you had and then you took to them or did they come to you because they were worried about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is a really small community and I grew up there and I, I lived there I have been working at the National Park for eight, nine years, so it is a small, I feel like you know everybody, right? Um, so when I left the park, I actually, we moved to California because my husband's from the Bay Area and his mom was sick. So anyway, I was, um, I really wanted to keep working there and this, I wanted to do sea level rise models. And I was really good with GIS. I hadn't done a lot of remote sensing. And so my friends at Alakai said, okay, I'm gonna give you a proposal. And they submitted it to the big pool, the national pool, and it got funded. So that's how it worked for me. But you know, these relationships are so important because actually I finished, but I've been, every time I'm over there, I'll go meet with the county and share with them and you know, just sharing and meeting. And so since then, this other project came through for three years. Um, also, I wanted to do some stabilized isotope stuff for the sewage in the groundwater. And so the Park Service, this is one thing that's nice with government agencies, is the end of the year, they have this money, and they just need to spend it. <laughs> oh my god, we have this thousand dollars, we have to do something with it. And so if you are, have relationships, and they like your work, and you have project ideas, in front of them, sometimes I'll say, oh my gosh, we have money, okay. Yeah, so $2,000 went to a lab in Berkeley and I got just got 100 samples analyzed. And just do anything for your data, you know. <laughs> yeah, so relationships are really important, I think. Any other questions? Thank you. a project of their own and so it's pretty cool it's a brand new really neat environment and if anyone ever wanted to come visit or give a talk or you know they're you're more than welcome to you guys know how to get in touch with me thanks